What's going on, fellas? This is Mike D, Mr. Double Down on You, with another episode of Black Fathers Now. And dig this, man. I know a lot of times I say I have eclectic brothers on the show, but I really got an eclectic brother on the show today. And this man is none other than my guy, Marcus Harvey, a.k.a. The Barber Star. And Marcus is a husband. He's a father. He's an entrepreneur. He's a celebrity grooming expert, the creator of the Musa Lair Gallery, which we're going to talk about. It's a gallery for this grooming thing, right? Um, he's considered the Barber Star. That's If you've heard the name Barber Star, you know who I'm talking to or talking about. He's also the creator and the star of Ghost Brothers, the TV show. And we'll talk a little bit about that, too, because that's kind of an interesting scenario there. But when I say the brother's eclectic, we're going to dive into a whole lot of twists and turns. But long story short, this is going to be a really dope conversation. So, fellas, ladies listening, too, because y'all like to hear what we're talking about. Let's welcome my man, Marcus Harvey. What's up, brother? What's happening, folks? What's happening? <laughs> Thank you for having me, Mike. I, that was a sounding intro. And I do feel eclectic. Uh-huh. I should have wore, like, wore like a blue jean jacket underneath the city or something like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> feel even more eclectic. Maybe uh-huh. a cowboy hat. Maybe a feather with it. I don't know. Man, like I said, blue jean jacket, cowboy hat yeah. with a feather. Uh-huh. With a hoodie on. You know, that's eclectic. That's the, that's, the, that's the black guy eclecticness of all eclecticness. You know Hold on. Saying? You, you, you got to describe that a little bit different because you sounding like Lil Nas X right now. And so... Uh, uh, am, I, am I choppy? No, no. You sound like Lil Nas X. No, no, no. You know how... No, <laughs> you know what the hoodie that's that's and, the, and the... <laughs> no, that's that Lenny Kravitz. You know, I dig that. That's Lenny Kravitz move. I don't get no haircuts for no, for no reason no more. You know, Lenny Kravitz <laughs> type move. That's eclectic. <laughs> I did. So I and wear, let me tell you, I wear blue jean shirts with no shirt underneath. That's eclectic. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and look, that's that blue jean got to be quality because if not, that bad yeah. boy gonna itch. So, yeah, it's gonna itch. <laughs> it's gonna itch. you gotta have flip flops on. Gotta be Eric Benet. Eric Benet out here. That's eclectic. I'm Shaza. Shaza from a different world is eclectic. Oh, Shaza. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was dog on uh, Freddie. Freddie's <laughs> homeboy. Freddie's yeah. dude. <laughs> First, the first F boy in the world. First F boy in the world. First F woke F boy ever, ever. The first woke F boy. Shazai yeah. from a different world. Yeah, yeah. I Shazai love it, dude. You bring back so much, man, and it's and it's cool because like the young folks ain't gonna know what you're talking about, yeah, but everybody, yeah, who's over about 37, 36 ish yeah. on up, they're gonna be like Shazai, yeah. Freddie's boyfriend. Listen, <laughs> the first one, that man, <laughs> Shazai was writing books. About which, bro? <laughs> Dang, this <laughs> world was ahead of their time before we they even were. knew what it was. Yeah. They were, they were, dude. And it's funny thinking about a different world. It was funny how it flipped after Debbie Allen became a part of the joint. Yeah, so, like that yeah. first season of A Different World, it was different. But I remember watching the backstory of it, and Debbie Allen was just like, you know, because she went to Howard. So she said yeah. she brought in all these nuances of a real HBCU. Like she said, it was a little nuance of like having hot sauce on the tables. She was like, yeah. before she got there, like when they were in the no pit, yeah, what no hot sauce. She was just like, how are you going to have an HBCU uh, pit? Or, <laughs> it ain't no hot, no hot sauce. Yeah. And so There's it was so interesting, there. man. Yeah. <laughs> and that's crazy, you know, you know, and that's uh, something that's like even dope now, thinking about even Debbie Allen in, in those times, creating and curating, because you did bring up curating, mm-hmm. um, you know, just how she was able to transition from dancer Yes. To director, to executive producer, to getting roots on, on television. It's like, when you think about it, like, like those are the type of people that I kind of really look at, like, as like trailblazers for not allowing to be just stuck in one discipline. You feel me? Mm. So it's like, you can like, like, I'm excellent in everything that I do because I know what excellence is. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And when I apply it, it's excellent. If I don't, then I just, I don't mess with stuff that I can't apply my excellence with. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I like rock with Debbie Allen with Gay. Ooh, you said, I don't rock with things or I don't fool with things that I cannot apply my excellence in. That's, mm-hmm. you know, that, that to me really lends itself to self-awareness, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're very keen on understanding where I have the capacity to be great. And mm-hmm. those are the areas in which I jump in. If I don't have the capacity to be great, honestly, that's not my lane. So what mm-hmm. am I going to do? I'm not going to fool with that. That's somebody else's lane. I'll support you. I'll, you know, be a fan, be whatever. But real talk, if I can apply my excellence, that's where I jump in. I, I like that, dude. 
I mean, we're going to jump into that because I want to really circle back around to that. Like, where did that come from? Like, how did you learn that? How did you start to find that aspect of yourself out? Because I think that's something that the brothers can legitimately kind of gain from. Because when you think about being excellent, it's first about having that self-awareness and understanding where you have the capacity for excellence, mm -hmm. right? Then you mm -hmm. apply that. But let, let's jump into that in a second. Before we get started, man, we talk about excellence. Every brother has a village around them. You know, it, it say it takes a village mm -hmm. to raise a child, right? But every strong man, woman, everybody has a village around them. Give a shout out to your village, brother. All right. So let me tell you about the village, right? So I've realized that my um, execution capacity has jumped considerably since I've had a team full of women, black women. Mm. That is, this is like fact. I, if I could be a study, I would, this is what I've been, uh, this is what I've deduced from my evaluation of what's been happening in my life as far as, especially even now during the pandemic, like this is some of the most trying times in this history, right? Of our mm -hmm. lifetime. You know, we've never been, at, at something with this caliber happening, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like in the mindset of like, you would think that somebody would be falling off or be losing, but the women around me, I got uh, my wife, Christina, mm -hmm. Christina Harvey, she, me and her have been married for 15 years now. No, not oh, wow. 15 years. Congratulations. Not 15. I don't even know how many years now. Mm -hmm. Let me not say 15. Those that, don't give me no congratulations because if she watches this and she says, 15, you know it ain't no 15. <laughs> Why are you always lying? Then now, now you getting me in trouble because I'm just trying. I'm trying to get the numbers. You see I ain't saying nothing. How I'm get you in trouble? Let me get my numbers straight, brother. Then you can ask me how long. Like that's top quiz. I'm I've been zooming too much education, so I don't even really know how to really answer things no more. So look, we versus eight. All right. It's okay. So oh, okay, it'd be twelve. Yeah, twelve. Come on. Yeah. Go. yeah. Just, hey. Actually, let me say this. Being in quarantine for these last few months has added three years onto our relationship, I feel Woo, like. Bro, dude, check this out. Yeah. We're, re we're recording this now, and obviously it'll release later, yeah. but our anniversary is coming up on July the 18th. It'll be 11 years for us. So we were born in 2009. That's how I was able to help you out. So we won you yeah, after yeah. you. Mine's coming up. Yeah. That'll be 11. Yeah, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bro. Yeah. Like, because, like, you know, it's just, it's just, so my team, Christina mm -hmm. Harvey. Mm -hmm. First off, Christina, um, the wife of of me, uh, my best friend, uh, literally my business partner. Everything that I've done business wise that succeeded was because she actually got involved in it. Wow. All the other things that I kind of do, like outside of her, because I don't want to necessarily have a stress between us, because I know how when my wife jumps into something, she's like very um, detail oriented, and I'm a very like. Yo, I got this idea. I got that idea. Mm -hmm. She's like, well, what are the details? You know what I'm saying? And then we'll wow. go back and forth. So every time that I try to like avoid that conflict, I've I've suffered in my business ventures. Mm. Every time that I've been willing to grow in conflict with my wife through our business, it's always succeeded and excelled. Mm. So we're gonna, we're gonna come back to that. That's deep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Christina Harvey, first off. Um me, okay, I'll give you even more more history about me and Christina. Christina, uh, when I we first got married, I was like I'm a I'm a stand up comedian also. Mm -hmm. So when we first got married, I was like going to cosmetology school and I was just starting stand up comedy. Okay. Um, my wife is an amazing singer. She sings background for Tasha Cobbs. Mm. She sings background for uh, Michael Stanley. She's done a lot like a lot of recordings. Devante, like it, she got. Delante, she's done a lot of projects, right? So, um, and then and she's also been like back, like back administration for a lot of those artists. Okay. And um, so I've always known her capacity to build systems, build, you know, um, structures. And I've just always known that. So, but it's just like, you know, you don't want to always want to have to be talking about business. So you be trying to find your way out. Nonetheless, when I first started doing barbering, I started doing comedy and I was doing it at a very high clip. A comedy actually started rising up faster. So my wife became like, she was a background singer because I used to have background singers in a band for my comedy shows. Wow. So she was the lead background singer for that. She also was like the president of my comedy entertainment group, put together all the emails, all the all the media meetups. Then when I did a, a comedy DVD, she helped me with my boy Hank Denson. 
to like really formulate that business partnership. Um, emails got me connected with Rashonda Coleman, who's my next person I'm gonna shout out. But Christina's done um, Bad Kids in a Blanket. When I went on tour, I did a 22 city comedy tour for colleges in 25 days. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was called The Miseducations of Marcus Harvey. Wow. And my wife was my tour manager and she set everything up. I'm talking about we drove from, we took a flight, we would get checks late, we would be we were on the road with no money. She was making sure it was held down, bro. So wow. And then even and then now we're in the gallery, the art gallery, uh, which is the Moose Layer. Um, so now she's the president, CFO of all those things. She just runs everything from licensing to funding to um, HR to like yeah, she's just all over the place. So shouts out to her, and she raises two adorable, beautiful kids, Nova and Kingsley. Yes, and, you got some and, beautiful and, babies. She, and, and those kids, she was in labor for 48 hours on both. You ready, bro? Christina just, like I said, she's been there um, licensing, funding. Um, we got funded uh, during this pandemic uh, with the, you know, with the um, the loans. Mm-hmm. And that was all because of her. So, wow. Uh, like, she just dope, man. She's just a dope, just a boss. She's mm. a boss. A boss, yeah. Mm. Literally a boss. I wish I could live up to her. Mm. Well, check this so out. Her, you're, you're connected to her. That's the key. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sometimes I'll be feeling like she's dragging me, though. Really? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, real talk. Like, because see, all the things that y'all see is like just, that's easy stuff. Like, I realized that before the pandemic, I could work nonstop if you just put me in an environment to work. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But like, like to build something like it takes time to like think about that. And the only way that I could have done that is with her. You feel me? So, yeah, dude, you know, it's yeah. interesting hearing you talk, man. It really sounds like the, the perfect marriage of the artist and the manager. Right. In a sense mm-hmm. that, you know, you're the artist. So you're the one that's kind of out front. You're the, you know, the brand of what people see, but she's literally kind of helping to, to pull the strings and she's orchestrating this thing and organizing it. And it's funny we're very similar in the sense of I'm kind of this creative idea, 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 idea type person. My wife mm-hmm. is very much structural about execution, structural about execution. Mm-hmm. And so it's really such a blessing to hear you talk the way that you're talking about your wife, because that's what I feel as well about my wife, which is really a dope way to look at it, man. And, and you know, it's funny though, because like also in, in includes with that is that, um, you know, um, Sometimes she sees my aggression and that inspires her though. You know what mm. I'm saying? Cause sometimes she didn't have, like she wouldn't jump into my business mm-hmm. if she didn't think that I would just be rash. Mm. So let's just say if I was a doormat type of dude, right. And I didn't have any type of like gumption, get to it. Mm-hmm. Like we would just be chilling. We would just have regular jobs. But like, I think that, like you said, because I'm pushing sometimes like, you know, um, exposure wise in a sense artistry wise mm-hmm. business wise that she sometimes like okay if i don't jump in he might take us to the deep end you feel mm. me so Dude, it's not so it's, so it's like she so it's like she's more so like i know he's gonna do it but how, what's he gonna break in order to do it mm. and she's like, here to help I, she's like i'm here to like not let you be a bowl and like i'll give you a perfect example we had packages mm. you know shipped shipped here to um shipped to the house like i'll just like if i have anything sharp in my hand mm-hmm. it won't be no it won't be no pretty mm-hmm. you know un- unveiling but she'll be like you know all you had to do is just get a, a pair of scissors <laughs> that, that, i feel you i feel you i feel you dude can i tell you what what helped me i got a homeboy uh brian you know brian russell he gave me this analogy he said i am like a balloon and my wife is like the string holding onto the balloon to keep mm. me from flying away. And yeah. I thought about that and I was just like, dude, that is such an analogy for me because I am like that balloon. Like if, you, if it's helium in it, you snip the cord, that thing's flying off somewhere. Right. So, but he and said, I can be hot air. I that's it. Hot and air that's too. exactly how I am. You know what I'm saying? And, and I, that's why I was like, I'm feeling it's like, it's like a kindredness when you're saying that, because I feel like that with my wife, she's walking with the string on that balloon. She's allowing that thing to go up high. Now she gives it a lot of string, mm-hmm. but she makes sure it doesn't fly away. You know, that's and so really good point. That's yeah, really good point. and it made me think about that when you were just talking about your wife, man. That's a really dope scenario, dope analogy really to kind of dope. put into practice. Yeah, yeah. Dang, that's really dope. It is. It is like literally, man. Balloon like I, string, yeah, 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 yeah. It's balloon on a string. I'm the balloon. She's holding that string and keeping it grounded. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's yeah. real talk. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so like you know, we're kicking it now. We're we're, we're excelling. Um, I'm about to push her into doing her own. Um, I'm about to push her into doing her own um, album soon. Mm-hmm. So you know, we're, we're getting some funding for that. So we just have a lot of good things going on. So it's about to be her turn. Mm-hmm. Um, the other person, the other people in my my um, circle, Marquita Minifield, she's yes. amazing. She's uh, been on point. Uh huh. On point, amazing. Like structuring me to be a, a a very valuable man. Even though I was, I felt like I was valuable before. But you know, like if you don't prune and and like him stuff, yes. It's like if you. It's not going to look right. So that's right. She's been, they've been pruning uh, her, Amy Moten. Um, Amy's been killing it. She's the uh, shops, uh, the galleries coordinator. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she's been doing amazing stuff with the with the artists, with um, content uh, production. When we have productions there, um, my right hand man, uh, the Donato Smith, Christopher mm-hmm. Smith, amazing guy. Um, my manager at the gallery. He does a great job. Um, and then just you know. Yeah, I mean that's the that's that that's pretty much the Fantastic Four right there. Wow. You know, um, everybody else uh, definitely has had a, a major part, but currently right now that that's the kind of the the the, the circle. The, that's the yeah, Fab the, Four. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> Fab Four, Fantastic Four, Four Horse Women and Men. You uh-huh. know what I'm saying? The, the, you know, yeah. So they they good. They good. They killing it right now. You, they make you it know, out easy. You, you dropped something there, man, when you were talking a few minutes ago, and this is something, again, we're going to jump into your story, but I, I can't bypass this thing. And you said, every time I've been willing to grow in conflict with my wife, I've succeeded. When I didn't, I failed. Like, that thing right there, I mean, that goes to, to Proverbs about, you know, you know, building with your wife, and, you know, she's a ruby, she's a jewel, she's literally you that's more precious than any type of jewel that you can find and building together in concerts but the concept that you dropped was when i'm willing to grow in conflict with my wife i've succeeded when i didn't i failed can you dive into that a little bit more because i think that's something that as men because you know we're taught to lead right we're taught to be the head we're taught to go out there slay dragons and you know bring home the bacon and do this and do that we're not always taught to grow in conflict with our wife. And that's led to success for you. Talk to us a little bit about that, brother. Uh, it's a new concept, one. Uh, so new that I just said it here. Because mm-hmm. I didn't even know that it was that, you know. But I've know, I was like, as I was thinking about our relationship and how we've been moving lately, it's been a lot of, like, you know, conflict. Not in a bad, it's just been rubbing, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And but it's always been rubbing into getting things done. You know, mm. Did you get something done? Yeah, I got it done. Why you, why you ask me if I got something? You always know I get stuff done. Mm-hmm. Well, do you? Well, well, not that last time, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. that's the type of like conflict that we go through a lot of times, but it's also like, it makes me even think about now, like, yo, like, if we, as I'm learning how to approach her better, I think, it makes everything else. Ooh. Ooh. Cause she's like, cause it's like, it's like, it's like Morpheus. My wife feels like it's like Morpheus, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes my wife's Morpheus and then sometimes she's Neo. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. we like switch roles. Like sometimes she's teaching me like to unleash my powers. Like, bro, if you would just say it this way, it would go way smoother. I know wow. that you are that dope, but you need to chill mm-hmm. because they don't know that they don't take that as you being confident Mm. and you proving your point. They take that as you being better than them. And I'm like, and I just be like, you know, like she'll do stuff like that. And she may say it in a high pitched voice or a mad Mm. voice in response to something that I say. But if I slow myself down and I think about everything that she says in in the last, she said in the last three months, I've only applied that and like really like used it softer on other people. So I go through the hard conflict with her, and then I and then I lay it up for other people, which is the weirdest thing, and I, and I, and that's something that we shouldn't be doing. But it's like, I know she's the only person who cares for me. You know what I'm saying in the world, dude? Can I can I just what's what's yeah, yeah. what's so powerful about what you say? First, I have two things. You mentioned growing in conflict, and as you were talking, I'm a person that thinks through associations. Like I, I try to make find analogies and references, mm-hmm. and you know whatever. 
when you say growing in conflict, I thought about the concept of friction, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can't have fire without friction. Mm -hmm. So that conflict is that friction needed or necessary for something to burn. And you need that thing to burn so that you can grow and you can cook and you can do what you got to do. So you got to have that. You can't be scared of it. But it also, once you get to this point, I think it comes to that point in our marriages, um, cause I've been married, you know, it'd be 11 years soon, you know, at the recording of this, um, mm -hmm. when it comes to a point in which you get comfortable with being okay, going back and forth and understanding that the intention of your spouse is not to hurt you. Cause I think that's a struggle that some of us have early on in marriages or early on in relationships is we haven't quite gotten comfortable to the notion that this person is not trying to hurt me. Meaning, can I even say, yeah, go I ahead. Say early, can I even say early in the day, not yeah. just in early in your relationship? Absolutely. Like, I fought, I fought, fight with that often. Like, yeah, because because they know us. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So she knows all my flaws. So when yes. she points out a flaw, I don't know if that's an attack mm. or or a rebuke mm. or a or her trying to heal by her exposing that this is something that continues to go on. <sighs> That's, man, that, that's, that's powerful. And the only way for that to be able to work or the only way for us to be open to that is for us to understand that they are not coming from a place of trying to destroy us. Like my wife and I've had numerous conversations and if she gives me feedback that's constructive criticism or I give her some constructive criticism or something that's challenging, we always have to kind of back it up with, but look, I'm doing this because I want you to be better. Right. I'm not doing this because I'm wanting to hurt you. Like, I don't want her to think anything that I say is ever with malicious intent. And the moment that you get to that point where you know that nothing my wife says to me is malicious, even if it's like hardcore, nasty, whatever. If she says you this, you that, you this, you that. I have to look at it from the perspective of because she's not malicious against me. Anything that she gives me is to help me to become better. And that's something that I personally need to work on. Then I don't take it personally. I just apply it to your point and that helps me to get better when I can approach it that way. But it takes a while to get there. Can I say this too? Yes. And this has popped up in my head. Go ahead. As I'm having these, as I'm having this conversation with you, I realize like uh, success clusters, you know, when I was talking about success clusters a while back ago where like, mm -hmm. everybody grows, but they're successful in this, in the same rights in different industries. Yes. Like you got to, and then how you have to have a successful group around you. Yes. I was telling my barbers yesterday that, yo, you know, you guys have to be here together mm -hmm. to be able to sharpen your iron, to be able to feel each other, to be able to know each other and be able to be able to grow. I also just thought about as me and you are having this conversation, like there's been times where I was like, yo, I want to be a better husband. But because, but because I wasn't talking to other husbands, mm. my mind wasn't getting kind of jawed like, oh, yeah, I want to be dope again. Like, you know, like, because sometimes, like, the way that I'm talking right now, it, it's my, my tone is understanding, like, oh, you know, trying to, like, break it down. But when we're talking with, like, when I'm talking with the wife, it may be, it's like, we're combative at, mm -hmm. at certain points. But like I said, it's combative over accomplishments mm -hmm. for us, for the betterment of our family life. We want to be better parents, so we're combative of us being better parents. Now they know, like, you're not doing this or you're not doing that. They're like, we're taking it hard on ourselves versus just be like taking a step back and be like, we're growing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And 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 I, and like I said before, man, it's just crazy that we'll have these strong fights, like with Morpheus mm -hmm. and Neo in the in the in the dojo room, just so that you know how to move around an agent. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And then you know how to move around them. So I just. I just really, really appreciate that she hasn't left me while, because while we've been training. Mm. Oh, Lord, that's deep. That like that's and I think about that as well, because I'm far from perfect. Like I'm an imperfect yeah. being a dude. I screw I'm, I'm probably going to screw up. I probably screwed up already today at some point, And mm. I probably screw up a little bit later on today. Like it's just yeah. I'm, I'm imperfect. And I know that I recognize that. But in spite of that. Right. Like that's that grace. That's that thing that when we really think about it, in spite of that, we're still here fighting another fight. We're still here to push forward. And that's the beauty and the blessing. To me, that's the beauty and blessing of marriage. You know what I'm saying? Because it's not just we cool or we just together or that's my girl or whatever. It's like that institution itself. I know we have in culture, a lot of people are anti the institution of this and whatever. 
But that's one of, to me, the beauties of this institution is it gives that framework of, you know what, it's okay to have that, you know, to grow in conflict or to have that mm -hmm. friction because we have this institution surrounding us that says even in conflict or even with that friction, we still together. You know what I'm hey saying? Hey, man, listen, I, and you know, it's not no hate or not no jab. But it's actually a an actual tip of the hat to how Will and Jade are handling their stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when you create a bubble of like, or you create an agreement of like, like nothing can rock us. Mm. Like I'm not saying you go set you you do your, you do all the you get entangled yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we we're not endorsing not, entanglements. We're not we're not, we're not, <laughs> we're not endorsing not, entanglements. We're not endorse, <laughs> endorsing entanglements and we're not judging people who get in entanglements. That's right. Because an entanglement entanglement is just that an entanglement. Like mm -hmm. that's biblical. Like she mm -hmm. used a biblical word on accident. Like mm -hmm. like you're entangled in something like so we're not judging the ones who are entangled. We that's are right. showing you a way to get out of being entangled because there's a lot of shame. And people who are entangled and they're like, yo, I can't get out of it. Absolutely. So, like, those who are watching, like, you can get out your entanglement. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, but nonetheless, bro, like, it's just dope to see how, like, with us, like, as far as like our 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 dream of my gallery hasn't broken us up. Hmm. And that's what I'm like, I, I'm so glad about like that union and that partnership that we have. Like, like I don't feel like nothing can rock us, you know what I'm saying? Like I will always fight for to 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 have the highest regard for her love, you know what I'm saying? In mm. her eyes, you know what I'm saying? So it's like even if I mess up to the world, like as far as like business wise, as far as relationship wise, as far as like talking, you know how I handle her, how I handle myself, how I handle my kid, whatever way that might not be pleasing to her, I'm willing to get back into the good graces of her, and I know find it too much of a task to start from ground zero every day if I need to. Mm, brother, it goes, it's intention. The mm. intentionality of service that you have in regards to your wife, that's the core of the foundation. And like you mentioned before, everything I've been willing to grow in conflict with my wife about, I've succeeded in. Like, I, I don't know how powerful, <laughs> I don't know how, if you realize how powerful that statement is. Like that in itself is, I mean, we could possibly just end right now and say, fellas, just repeat that over <laughs> yeah. and over yeah, and man. over and over again. That is deep. And um, but but we got to go more. We got to go more into your story. So really kind of, you know, we talked about your support system. We talked about your wife. We talked about just the mindset of being a husband and growing with your wife and learning how to be intentional about that. Talk a little bit about your backstory, man. Like, how did you from a growing up perspective, how did you get to this place? from a mindset perspective, like what are some of the inspirations, some of the experiences that led to you to being Marcus Harvey, the barber star, the owner of Musselaire Gallery, the creator of the Ghost Brothers on TV? I mean, talk to us about what led to that, brother. Um, yeah, oh, okay. And I'm gonna go try to go back through all of us. So yeah. growing up, my mom, my mom, single mother, but then, you know, my um, stepfather got involved around, I was about eight or nine, I think, nine or 10. Um, so, but for those years, me and my mom, my mom was just tough. Mm -hmm. Like she was just intellectually like dope. She, she didn't graduate from, um, she didn't graduate from college. She was involved in some very trying relationships when she was younger. I mean, she was adopted, her mom, her um, adopted mother died. She was like, it was, she's gone through a lot. And my mom is probably one of the funniest people that I know, smoothest people that I know. Mm. And she knows how to assimilate, like, because she's been in so much, like, stuff. My mom kind of knows how to just, like, just knows how to hustle. So mm. she was the first person that I saw as a hustler who did side jobs. I'm going to tell her about this one day. My mom used to do on her side on the weekend, she used to clean these white folks' house. Crazy. When I was, like, seven. We would go over there. She would clean their house. Um, actually, this was back in 93. I don't even know how old I was in 93, because you know I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Nonetheless, I know it was something like that because the Braves were going on their um, their World Series run. Wow. And the guys who, whose house she was cleaning had a whole bunch of AJC pages. Like, AJC was running this um, 
this thing like get to know the players. So they had a, a page ad, an ad page of a full page of like the, the just one player. So he would give me like all the players. So I had like David Justice, you know, uh, uh, Fred McGriff, all these mm-hmm. folks. Sid Br- Sid Breen, Sid I'm Breen, about, like, absolutely. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I'm Glavin, Smoke, Maddox, mm-hmm. Avery, all of the boys like on my mm-hmm. wall. And he got and he gave me those because my mom was cleaning the house and he's like, "Well, I got these things. I just thought he might like it." And my mom would clean the mess out that house. I was like, "Dang, my mom works a full time job and then we come and do this." And it just never just really hit me. Then when I was 12, um, we moved to this uh, townhouse and behind it was this, um, this complex, this like um, shopping complex. Like, mm-hmm. call, and there was this barbershop called Crosscuts. Okay. And that's where I got bit by the bug. So I was a 12 year old fat kid. Uh, they used to call, I, I saw this one guy sweeping up here in the barbershop. Now the shop, like I said, it's called Crosscuts. The owner was D.M. Mario. D.A. Mario had a shop, it's maybe, I think it was like 10 of them, 10 barbers. And I saw this young boy sweeping up the hair. They would give him cash. They were like buying him clothes. You know, the bootleg man come through or the booster mm-hmm. man come through. They'd be like, yo, little bag, what you want? What you want, Russ? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? He'll get, Russ will get some. And I'm like, yo, man, they always showing this boy love. And I asked my, bar, my barber, which was D, he's the owner. I was like, yo, can I do what he's doing? So they let me come on a Thursday. From 12 all the way to 15, I was the assistant kid. I was sweeping up hair, cleaning the bathrooms, cleaning the, the whole uh, the whole shop, cleaning their clippers, mm. um, setting up their appointments, uh, get, doing lunch runs. Wow. Um, just I've been running a shop since I was 12 without wow. me knowing I was running a shop. Wow. Like I saw how each barber was different, how mm. to kind of like what – issues they had were always dealing with I, it was just it now that i'm even thinking about it, as we're talking i'm like dang i've been groomed for this like yeah what i'm and, and i realized that everybody who's who's great at something has been groomed for it absolutely like i've been groomed to be a barber shop owner barber um community activist since i was 12 and 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 the reason why is because i was influenced by 10 other amazing black men who are barbers and entrepreneurs um, from the ages of 12 to 15. Wow. Uh, me and my, my mom got into a car accident. She shattered her knee. We had to go to uh, move to Tennessee, mm-hmm. um, which was a blessing um, mm-hmm. in disguise because I actually got to be in a small town with a whole bunch of people who cared for me. And I also was affiliated with the Boys and Girls Club from freshman in high school all the way to my senior year. Uh, and then, you know, um, upon graduating from high school, I went moved back to Atlanta went to Georgia Perimeter, um, and then I started cutting hair because mm. my brother was cutting hair randomly. Now, my brother, like, okay, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a child of three boys. Well, four, three boys, me and two other boys, mm-hmm. and we have a sister. Okay. Um, I'm the youngest, but my dad, we're all different mothers. Right? Gotcha. So, okay. But he's a good dude. Great yeah, yeah. dude. Paid all that child support. I got to give him up. <laughs> Tony, hey. Yeah. Tony, Solid. Give, like, Tony, that's, that's full child support, bro. Yes. Yes. Dang, I don't even know how you did that. Dog. I don't know how he did it, but the brother did it. He did, he did it. <laughs> Man, I don't know how he did it, but none of you Full child support? Come on. God, dog. And they were all island women. My mom was the only one who was an island woman. Uh-huh. So, uh, so you know they were going him. Ooh. Nonetheless, though. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love so, it. So yeah, so um my brother was going to Morehouse, right? Mm-hmm. So he's my older brother. My oldest brother lived in Sacramento all of all his life. So me and him were, you know, on two different coasts, but we always come to the summer to go to my dad's in Texas, mm-hmm. kick it with me, him, and my other brother Kareem, who lived in Texas. Mm-hmm. So my brother is finally moving to Atlanta, but I'm not in Atlanta because my mom got into the car accident. So I'm still in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. So he's a freshman in, at Morehouse, sophomore, I moved back, right? So I'm like, yo, I want to go to Morehouse. So I go to George Perimeter, but I was like, I can't afford Morehouse. So I go yeah, to George expensive. Perimeter mm-hmm. for t- like for a year and a half. I saw that I wasn't good at that. Mm-hmm. So I went to cosmetology school, mm-hmm. right? Because my brother was cutting um, at the time. Like his, him and his roommate, Storm Briggs, were cutting hair for the Alphas at okay. Morehouse. Okay. And just to have those collection of brothers, me being a young, you know, a young, impressive young bro, going to Georgia perimeter, not even getting the, the, the um, Morehouse experience, but only having it in where I lived because I was living mm-hmm. with my brother at the time. 
getting to see those brothers come in and like how cool they were, like how united they were. It just always, it just reignited me going back to when I was working at Crosscuts. Mm-hmm. Like, yo, I could cut hair. I was cutting hair. And then I was like, I was cutting hair in Tennessee. I could do it here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to cut hair. So I started cutting hair in Morehouse, right? Mm-hmm. Um, while I was in school at, um, in, while I was at school at Empire Cosmetology Beauty School in um, Dunwoody, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Um, while I was doing there, I was going, I was working at Morehouse. I was cutting hair at Morehouse. I was also working at, as an assistant for a young lady named Karen Owens. Another woman, another woman who built me. Mm-hmm. Uh, another woman. So, um, so pretty much that's just been my whole story. Like just progression from that to that to that. So then as we fast forward, I got linked up. Um, once I started cutting on Morehouse, I started getting a lot of young boys who were like freshmen. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they were freshmen and I was cutting them from freshmen all the way. And you know how it works, you know, yeah. as you grow, your clientele grows. And now these guys are like, state representatives, uh, mm-hmm. CFOs at, at major companies, you know, um, consultants and, and all this other stuff. So as I was climbing during that year of like, you know, learning how to like, you know, really getting my name up in Atlanta, I started becoming a celebrity barber randomly. I worked at the shop called Salon Ramsey. And at Salon Ramsey, um, the, the owner, Ramsey Shepherd, was actually about to retire when I came on. When I came on with him, he had five shops in Atlanta. It was crazy. Young boy mm-hmm. had five shops, two in Buckhead, one in Edgewood. He had a whole bunch of spots all over the place, right? Okay. So he was like, he was like, he was like the guy in Atlanta. So mm-hmm. he's like, Marcus, I see how you cutting, bro. I like your, I like your energy. I like all that stuff. Come rock with me. I put I, me and him. He hit me up for like a year straight. Finally, I was like, Yeah, bro, I'm gonna come work over there. Okay. As soon as I started working over there, he was retiring literally at that point. So remember, he was just talking about retiring beforehand. Year, okay. Beforehand, but when I came on, he's like, "Yeah, I'm done, bro." So here's my whole clientele. So he gave me all of his clientele. Wow. Of his like regular regular guys. Just like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. He just literally like he yeah. saw you. You met him before you started working with him, and he was yeah. just like, "I like your energy. I like who you are. I like what you got going on. Come work for me." Right. Yeah. All along, he was talking about retiring. The moment that you got there is the time that he was actually transitioning out. And it's interesting as you start. Have you read the book, The Alchemist? I, I have it. I'm reading it right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So as you start pursuing your personal legend, the universe or my belief structure, the creator of the universe conspires to help you along on your journey. So you talk mm-hmm. about this backstory of, you know, getting inspired, you know, inspired first by your mom, you know, hustling on the side, but then seeing the inspiration in the barbershop and just kind of jumping into that world itself. And you mentioned earlier in the conversation about how you jump into categories or segments or situations in which you can exercise your greatness because that's where you can then excel, right? So you mm-hmm. find areas that you can excel. You started doing that. And this guy who owns multiple shops saw you you didn't necessarily seek him he saw you and saw what you were doing and he was ready to transition and it was like this baton pass where he was in my opinion he was looking for this young brother that's of this caliber that i can pass the baton to and you happen to be that not happen to but you were that one that he was looking for yeah and at the time it was crazy about like you said the universe does conspire to kind of create who it wants to create, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I would definitely say that the universe tried to, God definitely tr- is continuously creating me, it feels like. Yes. Like, because it keeps putting things around that yes. makes, it, makes it so, right? So I was actually an armor bearer at mm-hmm. the same time when he was pursuing me. So the way that Ramsey found out about me was I was at working at this, uh, the salon with Karen, right? Mm-hmm. And at this point, I had kind of transitioned to being halftime her 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 um assistant, shampooing, doing the relaxers, doing the color, doing a blow dries. And then when I had clients, she had another assistant who could take over for me, and I could do cut my clients' hair. Mm-hmm. So one of her assistants was actually one of my clients, mm-hmm. and so I started cutting his hair. I started doing designs in his hair before, like I really started, like I really started getting loose with it, and that assistant quit at our shop and went to go work at Ramsey's. Mm. And that's how Ramsey found out about me. He's like, wow. The boy, the boy Brandon was like, yo man, his name is Brandon. Brandon's like, man, this boy Marcus is cold blooded. I mean, he was like, and he was a hype man too. He's like one wow. of those dudes who just, oh, he like, 
He like, that boy is cold-blooded. You need to get him over here. And as soon as he put me on, he sicked him on me. Like, I'm talking about for a year straight. And like you said, I was being groomed. I was being an armor bearer for my pastor at that time. So mm-hmm. I was like super humble, like very mm-hmm. moldable, coachable, just really seeking to try to find, you know, like who I wanted to be. So like, it was just very massively convenient for him. So right when I got on with him, I got off his regular clientele, right? So once I got his regular clientele, um, he was like, oh, he's killing it. He started giving me celebrities. So one of his celebrity clients, well, he gave me a celebrity. The celebrity he gave me, he gave me two celebrities. He gave me one, it was Hill Harper. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I cut Hill Harper um, for like a Tyler Perry uh, scene. Just He just needed something for a continuity, right? Mm-hmm. And, then I, and then he put me on to Nas. Now, mm. the crazy thing about the Nas joint was I, I literally had ran into Nas at Lenox Mall two years prior to me working at Ramsey's, right? Mm-hmm. So when I work with, so when I see him, I had these cars that look like uh, bookmarks, right? Okay. They were flimsy because I was getting them from Morehouse's uh, bookstore. Okay. Morehouse had a print store. And mm-hmm. one of my clients who worked on Morehouse was also doing a bartering with me for all my digital work. Yeah, yeah, so okay. My cars and all that stuff. And then he had a hookup at the Morehouse uh, printing spot to where he gets stuff printed up for me. Okay. So I passed Nas this, uh, this card, this barber card that looks like a bookmark. And I was like, yo, Nas, I know that you read. Uh, I'm just a talented barber, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I wanted to give you my information if you ever need me, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Never heard from him. Two year, fast forward two years later, dude's in my chair. Wow. And like, I'm like, wow, this is kind of crazy because when I left him, I was like, oh no, I'm gonna cut his hair. And I, and I've never, and I've never really, really that bold mm-hmm. when it comes to like my client selection. Like, I was like, no, I'm gonna cut his hair. And I didn't even know who Nas was really at that point. Cause like I said, I was a church kid. Mm-hmm. I wasn't listening to no hip hop really. I was, uh-huh. like, you know, a square. Uh-huh. So um, I think, and that's what made it more, that's what made Nas so com- comfortable with me. Cause I wasn't a fan. Cause I was that's like, right. like a guy. Mm-hmm. So once I started cutting him, he got more and more comfortable. You know, I'll start going out to his house and, and it just turned into a dope friendship. And um, like I said, me, I started working with Nas in 2011 and we still working together, you know, pre COVID mm-hmm. and um, you know, just being able to see the world is where I got that inspiration for the Musa layer. Mm. So what I started realizing is when I started traveling the world with Nas, we go to Paris, we'll go to South Africa, we'll be like Australia. Mm-hmm. And I would go all over the place and I would always like, we'll be in Paris one time. I was like, wow, this seems like this is where luxury is born. Mm-hmm. But then I realized that everything that made me feel like luxury was in Paris was because of those stolen monuments from Africa, right? Go ahead. Go and, I ahead. Said, and I said, and I said, Paris can't be the, the lead of luxury if they still in stuff that is luxury to build their own construct, right? Mm. So I was like, so I was like, I started just going to all the museums. And when I would go to the museums, I would see most of the stuff would be like African stolen art. You know what mm. I'm saying? So I was just like, I just always known the value of African art, yes. right? And what kind, and what it does to a spot. And then I was all, so then I started, as I was traveling with Nas, you know, when you travel with Nas, it's like traveling with a king. Mm. Like, so you stay in the finest hotel, you start getting bougie. Uh-huh. You're like, hey. <laughs> Ma'am, I only received one mint on my pillow. <laughs> Where is my other mint? You know? <laughs> so the mint down on the pillow. <laughs> mint bounces off because the bed's so tightly uh, made. Yeah. <laughs> so like, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> it's like that, man. So, uh, so I just started getting really equi- like, like just the experiences that I was having with this man. Like, we'll go to dinners. You know, I'm eating with some of like, eating with some of the, the craziest meals I've ever made. And I just started seeing like, yo, I want my clients to feel this so that they don't, they're not mad at me when I'm out and not around them. Mm. Wow. So I said, I want to create something when I get back. Cause every, t- okay. When I first started going on the road with Nas, I was making more cutting hair than I ever made in my life. I was like, wow, I'm getting that to get, make cut hair. Mm-hmm. So I always felt responsible for like I always I always felt whatever I made out there I had to bring that money back to the gallery or the shop mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying whatever shop I worked in so I was working at Ramsey so 
chair started breaking out. So what I did, I bought my own chair. Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. Like, got it reupholstered and everything. Mm-hmm. I, every time I would go on tour, I would come back and do something new. Get new clippers, like mm-hmm. all gold clippers, or get a, a steamer. Get mm-hmm. a get a hot towel machine. I would always get something new to enhance my client's experience so that they wouldn't be mad at me for always being out. Wow. And so that just started turning into like a, a way of life to the point to where it just morphed into the Musa layer. Cause this is like the third Musa layer that I've had. Mm-hmm. First Musa layer was in a small four, like a four wall little box. Uh-huh. Me, Hawk, Tyreek and Q. Mm-hmm. Second one was in East point. Mm-hmm. And then now this one, which is all me, is a full service like spa art gallery with with we have six chefs. We have, we have six Yeah, hot, chefs. Like, yeah, six we chefs. chefs, bro. We have six chefs, bro. We have six chefs though. Wow. So like so like if you're in Atlanta, you can literally if you had like because COVID, we all know the COVID situation. So we've even yeah. tried to change our whole business model, bro. And we only want personal relationships. We don't want people we don't know. Absolutely. Because like, now the time is like, you only want to spend time with those that you are willing to say, I could die with this person now. Absolutely. Period. So now we're doing things like literally just like having like events where you want to meet up with your homies. Y'all all go get a haircut at the same time. Somebody gets a massage. Somebody's getting their feet done. We have a, a chef come cook for you guys. Three course meal. Mm. We got an arcade in there. And then y'all just get to chop it up and just have a real life old school like feeling again you know what i'm saying an so, intimate experience it's an, an intimate, intimate experience, experience. yeah wow. so we're not even selling haircuts no more we're just really, really selling experiences that dude you said so much there that we again i gotta kind of back up a little bit okay you talked about when you're traveling around the world and the inspiration from musa Lair, and i assume that you're talking inspired by mansa musa correct Mansa Musa, the wealthiest man of all time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the reason why we use Mansa Musa, the Musa layer, Musa, of course, first name, Lion King, Mm -hmm. um, King of Kings, Mm -hmm. Gold King. Mm -hmm. Mansa Musa got all his wealth off of salt and gold, Mm -hmm. which in biblical terms is preservation, which is salt. salt Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. And gold, which is value. So we preserve the value of our culture when you come to the Musalair. So that's why we have the black artists. That's why we have the music that we play. That's why we have the elegant chairs that we have. You're sitting in a throne. Mm. That's why we have the finest cloth on your neck. That's why we do the best work in the industry because we want you to have, because we're being, like brothers are being attacked, man. We like, mm-hmm. we literally like right behind you. Mm-hmm. We're praying to people. Mm-hmm. Like they see that elephant in the back, People mm-hmm. want our trunks, bro. They yes. they just want our they just want our they just want our trunks, bro, because they know that we have something that ivory in us is so much deeper mm. than anything, bro. So I want to spot a layer, meaning a retreat for a wounded animal. Ooh, ooh, layer. Mm. So you may think you're endangered in the world, but here you're welcome, and we're going to build you back up, and we're going to send you back out. And the generosity that Mansa Musa had, which was the other thing that we really stand true on, was when he went on this pilgrimage to Cairo, mm-hmm. he had a Cairo stop. Mm-hmm. He's on the Mecca. Yep. He gave away so much money that he's upset their, their economy for seven years. So his generosity upset their economy. So when you come to the Musa layer, you're getting built, you're getting restored. And then when you go back out, we're upsetting the economy that you live in because you're going to mess things up because now you're inspired, you're built up. You see that a barber who came from a single parent home who was 12 years old, fat, chubby, they used to call book mink cleaning up the, up, up the shop, mm. now has an art gallery with the top artists in the world on his wall. We have at least $250,000 worth of art on our wall. Wow. And that's all by relationship. We haven't paid a dime for it. And it's all available for, for just because we want to enrich and enhance the culture. Mm. And that's all it is, Musa Lair. Dude, I'm gonna yeah. tell you, man, that, that's such a powerful concept because travel, and this is why I think travel is so big. Like one of the one of the goals for my wife and I, again, obviously once COVID 
you know, drops and everything. We want our kids to touch every continent in the world before they finish high school. Like we want our kids to do that. Like they've, we, you know, we're able to take, we took them to Italy last year and they've been to Mexico. So we got North America and Europe kind of checked off, but we want them to touch every continent. So we still got Africa, Asia, Australia, and South mm-hmm. America. I mean, Antarctica. Okay. We ain't gonna worry too much about that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but the reality is travel opens your mind to that. And to me, mm-hmm. when you talk about, your experiences and your exposure, I have a concept that ex, uh, exposure leads to opportunity. So you are exposed yeah. to seeing it, but the curiosity inside of you allowed you to go deeper than that. So you, most people would just go to Paris and like, oh, Paris, oh, Paris, oh, Paris. But then you thought about what's behind the scenes, what led to that. And that took you to the motherland, that took you to Africa. And it's interesting, even the concept of what we talk about, like raw materials, We talk about, you know, you think about chocolate, you think about Swiss chocolate or Belgian chocolate and all of that. The reality is 90% of the chocolate in the world comes from Cote Mm d'Ivoire or Ghana, right? Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. they just, it's not branded. That's right. Or you think about vanilla, you think about French vanilla and this and that. 90% of all vanilla beans are grown in Madagascar. Like people don't understand that the actual root to that is what we need to start celebrating. And one of the challenges in the system that we live in from a worldwide perspective is we have not taken hold of the processing of the raw materials. The raw materials are there, but others have come in and processed those raw materials. What you're doing with the Musa layer is you're taking the raw material, the us, the value prop mm-hmm. that's there. You talked about the salt and the gold and reimagining in that, but you're processing that into an exquisite experience that you're now selling. You're not selling haircuts, you're selling experiences. And to me, that's the analogy of the association of actually processing these raw precious gems and materials and Mm -hmm. resources that others have kind of let go astray. And I appreciate that, man. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. I mean, like you said before, man, like being able to like go and travel, man, really does change your mind because you see how much other people have done and are doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, going to museums also is something that like really has enlightened me too, because I, again, I say, you get to see that people did stuff before you. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're, you're like, your ego can't stretch too high because you see this massive painting that was done a thousand years ago mm-hmm. that looks better than a, a top, a, like a picture. You feel mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. So it's like, you can't have, like, all you can do is just like, okay, what am I going to add to the world Ooh. right now that's going to make, that's going to live like an artifact? You know what I'm saying? I think I, that was that, I don't know if that's a Malcolm Gladwell or a, a, either a Malcolm Gladwell concept or a Tony Roberts, but one mm. of them said something to the effect of, you want to live your life to make artifacts. Like mm. if, if there was aliens to come down on this earth a thousand years from now and they found a, a a semblance of you how would they find it what would they find of you mm. and that's all i'm just trying to do is just leave artifacts like a mug man like from being an nba barber to cutting you know for the last i was at the last five finals like cutting mm. the players like to being affiliated with bevel you know helping them with their development their their um research and development helping them develop their clippers their liners their trimmers their products like you know bringing them exposure uh you know to open in the art gallery to having two kids mm. like all that stuff man just like i'm just trying to create artifacts man man cre- dude and, and you're doing it and I, I mean and the thing is it's not just the musa Lair gallery like i mentioned before you're also the creator of a television show called ghost brothers like i mean so it's and then, like let me tell you how that came about and let me tell you yeah, how that came about tell me how that's that how that jumped about, off that came about by my brother creating it David Spratt. David Spratt was creator of, of um, Ghost Brothers, uh, the first the first version. He came to the shop, and this is why I say I, I give a lot of my cre- credit and props to Barbary, because he came to get a haircut. He's like, Marcus, you want to be on the show with me? Sure, why not? Mm-hmm. And ever since then, season one, we killed it. Season two, we started collabing. We created another show, season three, called Ghost Brothers Hunted House Guests. We created another, we're uh, working on another show coming up. But my relationship with Dalen was always forged because he would come get his hair cut weekly. Mm. And we would just always be building and chopping it up. So he was, I was interviewing him and he was interviewing me for literally 
years prior to us doing that, that, that project. And now we're able to just have like doors and opportunities to do other things based off of, you know, host brothers like that. So it's just. Dude, what, what yeah. do they say? Your, your, your gifts will make room for you. They right? make room for you. Yes. And but, I've been in the mud too, bro. Bro, but check this out. We all have. We all have. But the yeah. thing is, your gifts will make room for you, but you have to allow your gifts to make room for you. Yeah. And I think that's part of, you know, especially those that are high achievers or high performers in some aspect of life. Well, a lot of times we get into this control, right? Where we want to mm-hmm. grab it, grab the bull by the horns and control it. And I'm going to make this thing work the way that I want it to work. But the reality is if you allow your gifts to make room for you, you can't control it. It's an analogy I use, and this is a faith analogy, you know, hands off the wheel, feet firmly on the gas and the brake, right? Mm. And so it's the whole concept of when God says go, I'm gunning. When he says stop, I'm stopping, but I'm driving with my hands behind my head. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not controlling where it's going. I'm just controlling when it's time to go and when it's time to stop. And that's it. That's that faith thing. That's that walk that a lot of us have to be really mindful of in regards to how we operate. Um, Because if we do that, then our gifts can make room for us. Then we can be placed in a situation with our wife in which we're allowed to, you know, have to grow in conflict so that we and then we come to realize that that growth and conflict together is what leads to our success. You know what I'm saying? But Mm -hmm. it requires me to put my hands behind my head and just keep my feet on the gas and the brake go when I'm supposed mm-hmm. to go and stop when I need to stop. And that's hard. Mm-hmm. It's, that's hard. Like that, I mean, on a personal level, that's something I struggle with on a regular basis because I want to pull that thing to the left, pull it to the right, mm-hmm. want to make yeah. it do it. I'm so, you know, and, and society will tell you that you got to will it. You got to force it. Mm-hmm. I'm coming to realize that no, when you come in, when you're controlled by a higher power, <laughs> mm-hmm. no, you don't. You just got to go you, when you're you supposed glide. to go. That's it. And you got to stop when you got, when you're supposed to stop. Man, bro. I like that point. Even on the, on, even the end on that point, you got to stop when you got to stop. Mm-hmm. I got to get to the shop today. Oh, you do. You got to roll. <laughs> well, check this out. Well, check this Dude, check. Part two? Well, oh, I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. But before we go, before we go, yeah. your experiences, everything's come full circle and you're a husband and you're a father. How have your experiences thus far impacted you as a black father? Oh, I mean, it's made me more intentional. I mean, you it's like you want to, like I said, my father being a great man that he was, uh, he just wasn't there day to day. And so I just want to be, um, I heard a, a, a line, a rapper said, I'm just trying to be a better pops than my pops. Mm. And that's not a slight to him. It's like, because mm-hmm. I want Kingsley to be a better pops than I am. Because mm-hmm. then that's the way that our generations and our um, and our world continues to show its, its, its true dominance. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. By like, literally saying like, we don't we don't compete against each other only in the way of being better. Like mm. I want to be a better father than my father, and I want Kingsley to be a better father than I am. And I want to show Nova how her husband should be acting. You mm. know what I'm saying? Or his mindset. Not even necessarily his style, but his mindset. Ooh, that's deep. Check this out. You're standing on the shoulders of giants, and you want your kids to stand on the shoulders of their yeah. giant, which is their yes, dad. Sir. Amen. Yes, amen. Sir. Well, brother, hey, how can folks uh, connect with you, follow you? What's the best way to do so? Uh, just go on all platforms, the Marcus Harvey, T-H-E, Marcus Harvey. Um, also go follow the Musa Layer on all platforms, uh, Instagram, Facebook, our website, musalayergallery.com. Um, you can also find our art page that we just started, Musa Layer Art. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's going to be dope, man. So we got, we got some things going, man. We got events coming up. Mm-hmm. We got initiatives. We got more. Uh, our five hundred one c three is happening. Mm-hmm. So prom kings is coming back out. So just we got a whole lot, a whole lot, <laughs> just a mm. whole lot, and I'm excited about. It, so I got to live a long time. Absolutely. Well, look, let's look, keep keep living, brother, and keep doing what you're doing. And I'll make sure to have all your contact info in the show notes. Fellas, yes, make sure to follow the Marcus Harvey on all social media. Make sure to and visit. It comes to look, come to the Musa Lea Gallery. When I come, come to the to ATL, the even though I'm follically challenged, I gotta figure bro. out some way to come and, no, and kick we, it, bro. No, bro. We do that. We do it. We do a hair, we do a hair uh, wax joint. It's crazy. Man, look at it. I gotta come get it get done with yeah. it, man. I gotta come yeah. get it done. Yeah. Come <laughs> get it done, bro. You dig it, man. Well, man, hey, I appreciate you spending time with us, man. Most definitely. Y'all follow the Marcus Harvey across the board. Check out the Musilea Gallery. Just just connect with the brother. He got some dope stuff going on. 
continued success to you. Fellas, make sure to subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, YouTube, share, 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 share. If you're watching the video, cool. If you listen to the audio, cool. Share this thing out. It's going to help somebody. And until next sure. time, y'all be blessed, well, and wise. And I'll holler at you. Peace. Robo Shaka. <laughs>